Well, good morning, First Baptist. It's wonderful to be here with you, uh, to take time together, to worship together, and to have fellowship with one another, if not necessarily in each other's presence, but I feel the spirit of everyone here as we gather today. So I'd like us to think a little bit about a poem that was written in the late second century BCE, about 100 or two years before the time of Jesus. And this is written by Antipater of Sidon. He penned these words about the great temple of Artemis. And he wrote, I have set eye on the wall of lofty Babylon, on which is a road for chariots, and the statue of Zeus by the Alphaeus, and the hanging gardens, and the colossus of the sun, and the huge labor of the high pyramids, and the vast tomb of Masolas. But when I saw the house of Artemis that mounted to the clouds, those other marvels lost their brilliancy. And I said, Lo, apart from Olympus, the sun never looked on aught so grand. The ancient temple of Artemis was widely considered to be one of the great or seven wonders of the ancient world. And one kind of struggles to find kind of a, um, a modern comparison. Uh, you might think of something like, say, the uh, influence and scientific revolution founded in Houston at NASA, uh, kind of mixed with the complex architecture of, say, the Empire State Building in New York, uh, and kind of infused with the religious symbolic significance of the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, kind of a mix of all three of those uh, locations and uh, structures. Uh, Ephesus, where Artemis was, was a place of affluence, power, authority, and above all, spirituality. And it was a monument to the coastal affluence of that ancient city of Ephesus. For us in our modern kind of reality, economics and the exchange of funds and goods in our, our local economy here, at least in the United States, has a, in some sense a decidedly secular flair. Uh, we kind of try to, at least in principle, keep church and state kind of separate, the economy and, and religiosity separate. Of course, if you turn on the news these days, that's not so, uh, well, it's not as... Uh, they're not as separate as we might like to think, at least as Baptists. Uh, the ancient models of economy, specifically ancient Rome, they were inextricably linked and tied to uh, the ancient religious orders. Temples were economic and religious centers, and you'll notice economic and religious, they were very much infused together. Uh, for example, uh, slaves when they were branded or tattooed by cruel owners, uh, would take refuge in these temples and would pay whatever they had or work with for whatever they had so that the gods and the goddesses and the priests and the priestesses uh, would remove the blemishes, the marks that demarcated them as slaves. We have records of this. People struggling with infertility and disease would flock to these temples as well in order to kind of purchase salvation or deliverance uh, often, at least according to the records and the ancient death tolls, with minimum uh, efficiency. And Artemis was no different. Artemis was a powerful, powerful force in Ephesus and throughout the ancient Mediterranean Greco-Roman world. It was known as a place, at least of legendary healing and affluence. And it is a testament to the reality of Scripture that uh, we find such a place mentioned in its pages. Uh, we might say that the Bible wasn't, is not a cultureless book. It's not a, a something that, doesn't, that is easily kind of just copied and pasted into our own modern reality. Scripture has a decided context and reality and world that it assumes, especially as it relates to uh, epistemology, the way ancient people think. It doesn't always transfer to our kind of modern sensibilities. And that's a great thing because it forces us to consider and to reflect and argue and exegete and pray, above all, as the people of God and as people who take Scripture seriously. 
And we find this place, Artemis, in this first century world, located and nestled directly in the book of Acts. It is where we find Paul on his journey to Rome and beyond, perhaps, to Spain, the end of the known world, at least at that time. Everything and everyone, it seems, kind of seems to travel through, through Ephesus. In our Friday night study uh, that we do, well, every Friday night, uh, we, spend, so we spent some time a while back talking about kind of the perception of Christians in the, the first, second, and third centuries. How did non-Christians view Christians, or people of the way, as Luke likes to call them? And among other things, the early Christians were known as political dissidents, uh, insurrectionists, cannibals, uh, purveyors of superstition and nonsense, and deceivers of women. I mean, how else could they get women to follow them? You know, they had to be manipulating the women, at least of the ancient world. It's not as if women found some sort of powerful liberation in the gospel. And of course, uh, to make that point a little stronger, uh, the fact that we see the inclusion of women in the early church, specifically in Paul's epistles, and also here in the book of Acts, and uh, in Luke's gospel especially, uh, we see the inclusion of women, slaves, and even children. And they're uh, even marked as at least slaves and women amongst the highest persons and levels of the church. We think of Junia, we think of Phoebe, we think of Aphia and Philemon. We think of Onesimus, who's, uh, at least according to church tradition and history, was a bishop. And a lot of the names we find of uh, men and women at the end of Romans, in Romans chapter 16, some of them are slave names. So, uh, that for us, I think, as Christians, is a badge of honor. That's something that, while we don't relish the fact that people were persecuted and people were thought of, the early Christians were thought of in this way. We take pride that they were thought of in terms of a patriarchal, sexist, violent, oppressive culture that we were not participants in that, at least by and large. But one of the early things uh, claimed by our earliest critics, uh, for example, you remember the cannibalism and the purveyors of superstition and nonsense, we were not known for being violent. We were not known for our insurrectionist tendencies, at least insofar as we picked up swords and arrows and shields and fought against the, the ruling and reigning powers. Uh, Paul had a better way of doing things. In fact, we remember Paul saying in Ephesians 6 that our war is not against flesh and blood. And Paul's better way, as was his custom, was to get himself in not a little bit of hot water. And now we come to our story with mighty Ephesus, the mighty economy, the mighty principalities and powers of Rome and all these cities and states. And we find this little vignette of a story where Paul is nestled in. And we're given a principal antagonist a little bit, uh, a man involved in the local economic reality, a silversmith. His name is Demetrius. He made, quote, silver shrines or altars for the temple, and Luke, our, our narrator, at least in this text, speaks of Demetrius's capacity to make money, and he does so with kind of a slight critical kind of edge. Uh, the uh, ergesion uh, in Greek, or what we might call profiteering, it, it's often translated as something like business. He's good at business. Uh, but Luke's kind of, what we see later, what Luke does in this story is it's not business. It's not just a normal exchange of goods like a patron-client relationships. It's a little more corrupt, perhaps. Demetrius then, following Luke's characterization of his work as racketeering or profiteering, uh, gathers the various purveyors or, and artisans and speaks to the opulence of their profiteering in Luke, verse, in Luke, in, in Luke 19, uh, verses 25 through 27, and he says to the people gathered, you got this great scene of uh, Paul's legacy, his, his, his um, oh, what do you call it? His, uh, his name has come before him. His, his, his uh, oh gosh, what is the phrase? Anyway, people know more about Paul than Paul probably knows about himself. Legends are, are all over the place as it relates to Paul, and Demetrius seems to capitalize on this here. He says to them, 
Men, men, you know that we get our wealth or prosperity from this business at the aforementioned profiteering or racketeering or silversmithing. You also see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in almost the whole of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and drawn away a considerable number of people by saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be scorned, and she will be deprived of her majesty that brought all Asia and the world to worship her. Of course, this isn't the only place where Paul denigrates the Roman conception of the gods. Paul elsewhere writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, uh, which was a live debate in the early church, you know, are you allowed to eat meat and food that's sacrificed to idols? For Paul, it's like, it's, it's food. There's no spiritual, mystical kind of thing, eat the food, unless it causes someone else to have a problem with it, then defer to the other person. But he says, hence as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that, quote, no idol in the world really exists, and that there is one God but one, or there rather, there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist." Paul seems quite happy elsewhere, and apparently his legend precedes him, to have a very low view of gods made with things, made out of stuff. And John the seer in the book of Revelation personifies the various gods and empires with grotesque imagery that is designed to shock and offend. Indeed, it's hard not to be shocked and offended by the book of Revelation, which to its credit, is its point. In their polemic against the early so-called gods of the Roman imperial order and the Roman economy, the early Christians marked themselves as insurrectionists, not of sword, but of ideology. They were political dissidents because they refused to worship things formed by human hands. For the Greco-Roman mindset, you need a god or a shrine or some sort of memorial or something like that in order to worship. The ancient conceptions of the gods required at least, or at least they desired, a physical representation of God so that they could worship. Uh, and there's a certain logic to that. Why worship something you can at least grasp or see in some sort of sense, right? And you can see kind of the logic of that. But for the early Christians, Jesus kind of took that and threw it out the window, that, that window. Uh, Jesus replaced the need for walls and stones and silver and wood and images like that. For indeed, he was the very image of God in Colossians 1. In Jesus, the fullness of deity dwelt bodily in Colossians 2.9. Jesus is the very mercy seat, as Paul talks about, Replacing the need for a temple. The church is a people. It's not a steeple. Church is a people, not a steeple. And so that legacy, that legendariness, that uh, ideology has been infused into the activity of the early Christians and the people of Ephesus, especially the people involved in the economic sphere, don't like it one bit. And notice the worry. Not only is Demetrius and his crony buddies, not only is their economic security threatened by Paul and the early Christians, but Artemis' glory will be deposed. One wonders if their secret worry was that the fall of Artemis would be the fall of their economic way of life. Indeed, their very existence as silversmiths, as artisans, as people who worked with their hands with things it was all centralized on the realities of the local temple cult. 
And Paul was threatening that and putting them out of business by saying God cannot be represented by, by things. Things do not represent God. There is no golden calf or piece of jewelry or piece of carved stone or any such thing that can even come close to representing who God is and what God is. And especially as it relates, I think, to the early Christians was you cannot replicate God's loving character in a stone. God's loving character cannot be replicated by human things. The character of God for the early Christians meant you can't have things like that. And because Paul was not content to be quiet, as was his custom, uh, this all leads to a massive riot that is only quelled by an unnamed town clerk. I would have loved to have known his name because he saved Paul, basically, but we don't know his name who basically reminds the entire riot group of writers that a large riot will incur the wrath of the Roman Empire, and so maybe don't be so loud about Paul. I mean, you can have protests now. We have protests and stuff like that. Uh, back in the ancient day, a large gathering of people, especially if they're angry, especially if they're shouting things. Luke says they're shouting, great as Artemis for two hours. The, the Romans, who were in charge of that city, that'll... That'll turn some heads. That'll get the, uh, the principalities, the powers, the authorities looking at you. And in that time, you don't want to be on their radar. And so Luke kind of pulls back. He kind of tells the story, and then the story kind of continues on as Luke's custom. But let's take a pause on this, because this is where it gets really profound. In, de in his depiction of Demetrius in his depiction of what it means and what their fears were about gods and human things, gold, silver, stones. Luke's economic critique is sharp and it cuts deep. Where the dominant cultural allegiance to a specific entity morphed into a blind affiliation to the gods of silver and affluence and opulence, the God of Israel, according to Luke, stood in direct opposition to that. The pillaging of the poor who were willing to sell everything to participate in the temple cult, they were willing to sell everything for the crumbs that fell from the priests and priestesses' table, they were given a different vision here. Jesus doesn't require your money, or your gold, because Jesus cannot be bought. God does not require your gold or your wealth, not because he has no use for it, but because of his character, God cannot be bought. And what we see is that Jesus requires instead our allegiance, or as what we might call Faith. And Luke's continued critique of this Artemis cult in this temple has, of course, economic implications and involves a massive and devastating assertion that the accumulation of wealth and power by the various empires and cults was something that was directly in contradiction to the way things were meant to be. Luke did not see Demetrius and his crony buddies and his profiteering as an isolated event. It wasn't just one guy deciding to get wealthy and rich. It was the very bedrock of the ancient economy. And we see a similar critique in the book of Revelation, where Babylon, uh, a metonymy or a personification for Rome and the nations, is utterly destroyed. God, God just levels the city. God levels Babylon. Babylon. And we have an entire chapter dedicated to what the traders and merchants, which includes their being involved in human trafficking and slavery, and they mourn the demise of the entity they fed. Who will buy our slaves, our spices, our cloth, and our stones, 
Such majesty lay at the heart of Artemis, Rome, and Mystery Babylon. But the majesty of the early Christian movement was centered not on the accumulation of power and prestige, but on the message that the God of the universe gave up all power and prestige and emptied himself by taking the form of a slave and being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, this God humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even a death on an accursed cross. God is not found in the accumulation of wealth and power. God is found in the renunciation of the ways of the world. We remember what Jesus said in chapter 6 in the Gospel of Matthew uh, in his extended discourse on or what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The joke, of course, there's a little bit of a bit of humor here. It's like, uh, why are you uh, why are you accumulating such things? You can't take it with you. You can't take any of this wealth or power or this coin or this stock or this house or this car. You can't take it with you to heaven. So ultimately, according to God, what? What, what significance is it? Of what significance is it? God is not impressed by the impressive wealth of Wall Street, or Artemis, or Amazon. And this message forces us to ask, how can I have the mind of Christ who put our needs above his own? What can we do to empower others? What can we do to put others before ourselves? How can we outdo each other in holy reverence and joy? It's in such a affluence and, uh, I want to say dedicated, that's not the right word. A pursuant culture, we pursue things, we work day and night, night and day, working our fingers to the bone. And instead, the message of the church in some ways is, how can you, instead of trying to outdo each other in fiscal matters and being the head of your company and all of that, how can you outdo one another in joy? How can you bring joy to people? As a church, we have been given a generous gift, and we in turn emulated the call of Christ by blessing others with that gift. Sometimes that means if you're, say for example, if you're married, it sometimes it means listening to your spouse when you're tired and giving him or her the time of day. I'm a new dad, uh, well, I'm a new dad, Allison's a new mom, and uh, the, our, our son, Nolan, is teaching me more and more than I ever wanted to know about sanctification and patience. And when I'm tired and stressed and beaten down and depressed, and he's crying and he wants dad or mom to hang out with him, and the look of joy on his face when I pick him up and burp him or spin him around or uh, because I'm me, I put on a hockey game and we sit and watch and he humors me by enjoying it. When we kind of get out of ourselves because we're told we're cogs in a machine, we work our 40 or our 50 or our 60, and especially during the COVID time, a lot of us are struggling with work, 
and there is a genuine sense of stress and anxiety and crushingness. That level of economic reality, where you're the lowest person on the totem pole, is as true and real today as it was in Jesus' day. And instead of being consumed with our own glory and our own pursuits of things, maybe it means taking the time that Jesus took to gather children together and to laugh, to hold our spouse in our arms, to reflect and to pray on the goodness of what God is doing, especially for the things that we can't see and the things we may never see. When even our eyes have, that have seen the wall of lofty Babylon, the road filled with chariots, the statue of Zeus by the Alphaeus, the hanging gardens, the colossus of the sun, and the heights of the great pyramids, and even the great temple of Artemis amidst the clouds. Where our eyes continue on beyond Olympus, and we say that we have seen a greater glory beyond the grand. And we realize that the love of God is our currency. The love of God is our currency. That is the message that Paul spread that is the message the earliest Christians pushed. No greater love. Have the same mind of Christ that was filled with joy and mutual encouragement and generosity. Because at the end of the day, we can't take all this stuff with us. So the legacy we leave as Christians and the legacy Luke and Paul left for us is a legacy of love and joy for our holy God, and for our wonderful and sometimes not so wonderful neighbors. So let us have the same mind of Christ. Let us not be participants in the food chain of economic realities. Let us not forsake the glory of God for the glory of a promotion, but instead hold everyone together as people worthy of love and deserving of joy. May we be filled as the church and as the people of God with that calling. Amen.